Okay. So welcome to today's talk and I'll start again with the introduction. So Karen Folds is an expert in the development of surface enhanced Raman, Raman scattering and Raman techniques for novel analytical detection strategies, in particular multiplex bioanalytical applications. She's per published over 150 publications and her group's research has been recognized through multiple awards. She's a fellow of the Royal Society of Chemistry, Society for Applied Spectroscopy and Royal Society of Edinburgh. She is the chair of the Infrared and RAM Discussion Group, an elected member of the RSC Analytical Division Council and the Federation of Analytical Chemistry and Spectroscopy Societies Governing Board. She is an associate editor for Analyst and serves on the editorial board of RSC Advances and Analyst, an advisory board for Chemical Society Reviews. So we hope you're ready for the talk and I'll hand over to Professor Folds for her interesting talk. Thank you very much. I'll just try and share. Can you see that okay? Yeah, that's okay. Thumbs up. <laughs> I'll just bend the pointer. That's good. Okay, thank you very much um, for the invitation to speak today. It's, it's nice to get the opportunity to speak to you, especially um, undergraduate students for a change. So hopefully I'll explain some of these acronyms as we go through um, and what SERS, CSORS and RAMIN is. Um, but this, this is a, um, some photographs of our building at, at Strathclyde, um, where, where our research is hosted in the Technology and Innovation um, Centre. So in general, we use Raman, surface enhanced Raman and spatially offset Raman um, to apply it to bioanalytical problems. Um, so what my main drivers are, are sensitivity. So I am an analytical chemist and I want to detect things at very low levels, but also want to be able to detect them quantitatively. We're also very interested in multiplexing. So multiplexing being um, can we carry out detection methods, assays that allow us to detect multiple species within the same sample rather than having to carry out individual tests for each particular um, species and most of those species being um, biomarkers. Um, so we use lots of different approaches but generally these combine Raman spectroscopy with nanoparticle based um, assay development to create nanosensors. So we do a lot of work in biomarker assays, so the, the detection of um, biomarkers that you may find in your blood, so for example, C-reactive protein, cancer biomarkers, um, um, drug-induced um, biomarkers. We also have historically done a lot of work in molecular diagnostics, which is the detection of particular um, um, DNA sequences that may code for a particular disease or for, for the presence of a bacteria, for example. Um, we're doing quite a lot of work in bacteria detection, so the detection of whole bacteria, and I'll, I'll talk about this um, today, um, as well as imaging approaches where we can image across, for example, a cell to get cellular information um, using different approaches, using Raman itself. Um, but also um, nanoparticle-based approaches using surface enhanced Raman, as well as stimulated Raman spectroscopy. I'm also extremely interested in being able to um, detect Raman signals at depth. Um, so potentially applying this one day maybe to in vivo analysis where we can um, detect um, signals from below the surface without having to, to probe that surface. And again, I'll talk, I'll talk mainly about these three aspects today. So rather than scattering, some of you may be less familiar with the approach. I'm not having um, been taught about it or le learned about it yet. So I'm just going to use this cartoon to essentially give you a bit of a background to it. So if this is our sample here, in this case, a brown splodge, but this could be anything that you've um, spotted down. Um, so Raman uses um, a laser beam as an excitation wavelength, whereas compared to something else like infrared, which is also a vibrational technique, it looks at, um, its excitation source uses multiple um, wavelengths. It's a broad, um, broad spectrum light source that then look at which wavelengths have been absorbed. But in the case in Raman, it uses a laser where the sample is only um, excited by one excitation wavelength. 
So in this case, imagine this is a green laser. So this could um, have a wavelength of around about 532 nanometers. So we interrogate our sample. Most of that light is just scattered. It hits the sample and it scatters with the same wavelength. And this is termed dryly scattering. And that doesn't give us any information about our, our um, panel light. However, one in a million of these scattered photons um, is scattered with a shift in wavelength. So that shift in wavelength from that excitation wavelength is what we then measure. And that tells us about the frequency of the vibrations of the bonds in that molecule. And from this shift in frequency, um, we can get um, a molecularly specific fingerprint spectrum. Um, so this um, is a spectrum of aspirin. So you can see that we have the sharp peaks, the same as you'll see in an infrared spectrum, which gives us molecularly specific information with each of these peaks telling us about what vibrations, what bonds are present in the molecule. However, as I forgot to say, um, it is intrinsically a weak effect. So for every million photons we put in, only one of these is Raman scattered. So in terms of number of photons, in and random scattered light back out, the process is intrinsically weak, so it's not very sensitive. So what we do is combine Raman with what we term um, surface enhanced Raman. And what we do in this case is we absorb um, our analyte onto a roughened metal surface. So, so this approach was discovered by accident by um, Fleischmann who absorbed um, was absorbing pyridine onto a silver electrode to carry out electrochemical measurements combined with Raman. And what he discovered was <clears throat> what he discovered was that there was a huge enhancement in the Raman scattered light. Um, originally, he just put this down to an increase in the surface area um, because the um, silver electrode had been roughened, which might have allowed more pyridine to go onto the surface. Um, however, it was later discovered that this effect was, was due to an enhancement in the Raman scattering by the, 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 the enhancement by that metal surface. So what we do is we take um, a metal surface, and in our case, we use predominantly metal nanoparticles of silver and gold. So if this is our metal surface, we absorb our analyte onto the surface. We then carry out the Raman experiment in the same way where we excite with our laser and measure the scattered light. But in this case, there's a huge enhancement um, in the scattered light that we get back. We still have this nice vibrational fingerprint spectrum as well, but we have a great enhancement um, in sensitivity 10, over a million times compared to Raman alone. However, we can even further enhance this um, signal that we get back by um, using what we term the resonance effect. So if this analyte molecule is coloured, so say we have um, a, a green molecule um, that absorbs um, light, if the excitation wavelength that we use of the laser beam matches the absorbance maximum, so you can get the absorbance maximum by carrying out UV vis spectroscopy, so if we have a molecule, for example, that absorbs strongly at 530 nanometers and we use a 532 nanometer um, laser beam to excite it, then we get an even greater enhancement in the scattering that we get back. Um, and up to 10 to the 14 has, be, um, has been reported. So we've gone from a very weak if, if Raman effect to um, using the nanoparticles um, as well as the, the properties of the molecule, if the molecule is colored and has a chromophore, to hugely enhance that Raman that we get back. What is also really nice about um, this approach, we now have sensitivity that starts to rival what you get with fluorescence spectroscopy, but fluorescence spectroscopy gives you very broad um, bands in the spectrum, which makes it very hard to multiplex and it doesn't give you molecularly specific information about the molecule in the way the vibration of spectroscopy does. But with CERVs, we have these really nice um, fingerprint spectrum. So if we have multiple components in that sample, we can use the pattern, the fingerprint of the peaks to identify what components are present within the mixture. So I said that we predominantly use <clears throat> nanoparticles. Um, the reason that we use them is that they are very 
brightly coloured, they have really high extinction coefficients. Um, what they have, uh, so nano, um, nanoparticles vary in size between one and 100 nanometers. If you look at gold, for example, the large particles going down to the smaller ones, you can see that we have this lovely range of colors. These are generally, when you make them about at a concentration of about 10 to the minus nine, so nanomolar concentrations. So these are very low concentrations of nanoparticle, but you can see how optically bright they are. Um, this is due to what we term the surface plasma resonance. So we have electrons that are able to oscillate on the surface of, of um, these nanoparticles, which then when we set, shine light on it, those electrons can absorb and scatter light. And we're interested in the fact that when we, they scatter light, they increase the random scattering of any um, molecules on the surface. So again, you can see the silver as we decrease in size, you get a range of colors as well. Um, but these have very high extinction um, coefficients, very high um, absorption and sc scattering properties. So there's two approaches to CERVs, um, what I term direct detection. So we can take our nanoparticles and then directly absorb a molecule onto the surface. In this case, this is um, a depiction of a, a, a DNA sequence. This is challenging because there's, we have to um, get the molecule onto the surface in the first place. So when we make nanoparticles, generally they're highly negatively charged. We, we use um, a citrate reduction of the metal um, and the citrate then caps the surface of them. Because they're highly negatively charged, that allows the nanoparticles to stay in solution because they could remain isolated. If they weren't highly negatively charged, they would come together and just settle out of suspension. But because of this highly negative charge, if we want to put an analyte onto the surface, that can be challenging, especially if that analyte itself is negatively charged. So we can change the surface chemistry, um, for example, to put a negatively charged molecule, such as DNA, which is a negative backbone on it, onto the surface, we can coat that surface with uh, a positively charged molecule, such as fermine, which is a, a polyamine. Um, and then that allows us to bridge the negative nanoparticles with the polyamine to bring the DNA down on the surface. Also, we increase the, the response. So isolated nanoparticles give a lower um, SER signal if we aggregate them and you bring them together, we get an increase in the surge response because we have an increase um, in the, the electromagnetic, the electron enhancements at the interstices between the nanoparticles. So this can be challenging because you have to create, um, get your conditions right, your nanoparticles, your surface chemistry um, to get your molecule on the surface. And if you're carrying this out on complex matrices as well, um, there'll be other things in the matrix as well as your analyte. So you'll get a very complicated spectrum that can sometimes be challenging to identify your analyte within. So where possible, we try to use what we term indirect detection. And this effectively uses the nanoparticle um, as a label and as a probe that goes out to seek and find the molecule you want to detect. So what we do is we take the nanoparticle, we then code it with um, a dye molecule. So that dye molecule will usually be in resonance um, with the excitation wavelengths to enhance the sensitivity of the detection. Um, and also we know what the signature of that molecule is. Um, so we're effectively coding the nanoparticle with a surge response. We can then add um, a biomolecule onto the surface or a ligand that will then bind specifically to the target, such as an antibody um, that will bind to a protein marker or um, a DNA sequence that will bind to another DNA or a protein. So in that way, we're using um, the nanoparticle and cell response as a label that we'll then use to, to bind to our target. I mentioned briefly that multiplexing was a big driver as well as the sensitivity of the detection. So we can code nanoparticles with different dye molecules. Um, each of which can have um, a unique um, surge response. So we can tune the, 
our system to give multiplex detection. So if we know what the signature is we're looking for, when multiple of those signatures are present in the sample, we'll get a more complex spectrum. But using data analysis techniques, we can then deconvolute that multiplex spectrum to find out what was present in the original sample, so detecting multiple species at once. And we've done this using various different approach, approaches, chemometrics, and using Bayesian methods, so statistical approaches to, to de deconvolute that data. And we've detected up to six different um, sequences or published up to six, um, but you should be able to detect higher amounts than that. If you have the, the correct um, labeling strategy, the correct signatures. So the first part of the talk, I would like to talk about um, bacteria detection. So I'm sure I don't need to explain why it's important to detect bacteria, both um, you know, in food production, and also, you know, if you have a bacterial infection, but it's very important to be able to detect the correct strain of bacteria that is present. And um, so these are some images of some common bacteria, particularly Salmonella, E. coli and, and um, Campylobacter, which are frequent um, causes of food poisoning. So the consumption of foods contaminated with um, bacteria is obviously a huge um, concern. Um, and food production, because you want no bacteria um, in the food before it goes to, for example, the supermarket, because it then sits on the shelf for a while. And if there is any bacteria in there, then that bacteria very rapidly amplifies. Um, so, for example, one bacterium um, can become several millions, even within eight hours, um, and that can obviously rapidly increase in food products very quickly if they're sitting on the shelf, depending on their shelf line. Um, so unfortunately, bacteria live in certain foods, um, particularly bad, you know, is chicken, make sure that you cook chicken properly, um, you know, eggs, dairy products. Um, and these are chilled products that contain often listeria, which can be highly harmful, particularly, you know, for people with underlying health conditions, pregnant people, um, and um, um, elderly people, sorry. But the bacteria can amplify rapidly. So we need to find ways to detect the bacteria is present. There is multiple ways to do that. Um, there are simple luminescence biochemical tests. Essentially, these are usually just based on ATP type detection. They basically just tell you if there might be a bacteria present, i.e. there's something live and producing ATP present, but it won't tell you what type of bacteria is present. The most common approaches use um, bacterial culture, so you have to culture the bacteria. Normally, you have to culture the bacteria for at least 48 hours. Some you can get away with less, but it's usually at least 48 hours to, to produce enough bacteria in the, the culture for the, you then to be able to identify it. A lot of bacteria are very um, visually different, so you can then often use um, microscopy to then identify which bacteria is present due to, due to what it looks like visually. Um, however, to get more sensitive species and strain information, then you normally have to carry out PCR or ELISA. So PCR um, essentially tells you what DNA sequences are present, which then allow you to identify which strains and species are present. And ELISA uses an antibody-based approach to bind specifically to the surface of the bacteria. So these processes work really well, but the issue is that they are rather time consuming because even these approaches that give you more species specific information, they still require an amplification step. So they still require um, culture to be carried out for 24, 48 hours before the test is then carried out to tell you what bacteria is present. So time is actually the main issue here. Some of them are expensive in terms of the reagents and equipment are, that are required. Um, and they definitely um, require trained staff to, to culture the bacteria um, and then identify it. What this means is prevention is often delayed. So if it's um, for a clinical reason, normally if someone's suspected to have um, a bacterial infection, they are straight away put onto a broad spectrum um, antibiotic. 
um, the, the, the identification of the specific bacteria is carried out afterwards, and then the antibiotic may be changed um, depending what bacteria, specific bacteria is causing the infection. That means that treatment or the correct treatment is effectively delayed, and also it means that people have been treated with broad spectrum antibiotics, which um, also contributes to the increase in antimicrobial resistance. So what is required, we are specifically interested in the food production area and the work that we're doing. And that again, um, in food production sites, they want to eliminate any bacteria being present in the area and they frequently, frequently swab um, and check the, the, the food products, but also the, the components, the, the, the ingredients in the food to check for any bacteria. But currently, um, most food production sites don't have a microbiology lab on site. So for them to get species specific information, it can often take them up to a week because they have to send the sample off to get analysed and get the results back, which means that action um, is delayed in terms of how that is dealt with. So in all approaches, whether the food production or clinical, then faster tests are required, faster and simpler tests that can potentially be carried out um, at the point of use, the point of requirement, and that have the ability to detect multiple bacteria and screen for them and give an answer quickly. So the approach that we're working on um, has been developed by our postdoc, Haley. Um, so this is an E. coli bacteria. So she has developed magnetic nanoparticles. So these have an iron magnetic core, and then they're coated with silver. The silver in this case is not being used for um, serous enhancement, but it allows us to further functionalize something onto the surface. So in this case, what we do is we can functionalize this by a, a capture molecule that will bind to the bacteria. And what we use is something called lectins. Lectins are, um, proteins that burn bind to carbohydrates and the carbohydrates that are present on the, sur the surface of the bacteria. So in this way, we can bind these magnetic particles to any bacteria. Because they're magnetic, we can apply a magnet that then allows us to pull the bacteria out of the sample. So if you have a complex food sample or a blood sample, for example, it means you can capture the bacteria and then separate them away from the complex matrix. Um, then what we do is add our um, specific probe molecule, and what this is is a silver um, or gold nanoparticle. It has a specific Raman reporter on the surface, which gives us a specific Raman surge response. And what it has on here is an um, antibody. This antibody is specific to the strain of bacteria, so in this case E. coli. So this nanoparticle will only bind to E. coli, and we've coded it with a specific surge response. So we can pull this down, wash everything away. If we get a particular signal, we know that E. coli was present within that sample. But I've mentioned multiplexing a few times now, um, but in this way, we can make multiple nanoparticles. So along the bottom here, we have three different nanoparticles. They all have a silver core, but they have a different dye on the surface. These are just color coded um, to show that they're a different dye. They, have, they give a different spectrum and they have a different antibody on the surface. This one has an antibody that will only um, bind, bind to, in this case, MRSA. This one will only bind to E. coli and this one only to Salmonella. So if we have all three bacteria present, if we add a mixture of these three nanoparticles, um, they will only bind to their, their specific bacteria, and this will allow us to identify which bacteria were present in the sample. Um, we then get a complex spectrum that we can use specific peaks in this to identify which bacteria were present in the sample. And unfortunately, in food samples, it's very common for there to be multiple different bacterial species um, present. Um, hopefully, in terms of clinical infection, it's usually one type of bacteria that's cause, causing the infection. Or, but in bacteria and um, food, it's quite common, unfortunately, for the multiple bacteria present. That's why we need to cook most foods to get rid of them, kill them off. So, using this approach, um, once the bacteria is present, we can pull it down and we'll get a signal um, from our nanoparticle on the surface. 
So this is the results that we get back. So this is the data for E. coli. When there's no E. coli present, we still get a very low background signal um, because it's quite hard to pull down and wash away all those nanoparticles. Some of them will still get caught up um, within the magnet in the systems, but we can wash it away so that we get a low signal. When it's present, we see this um, molecularly specific vibrational serum spectrum. And that then allows us to, we can just plot the intensity of one of the peaks in the spectrum, this one here with the star. Um, and that allows us to show that we get a high signal when the bacteria is present and a low signal when it's not. And equally, these are the, the dye molecules, the reporters that we have on the surface of, of, of the nanoparticle, and we can code it. So we get a different signal if salmonella is present and a different signal if MRSC is present. It's also important in many environments to understand um, the concentration of the bacteria that's present. Um, so what we've done here is we've decreased gradually um, stepwise the, the concentration of bacteria that's present in the sample. Um, these values, CFU, stand for colony forming units, so effectively the number of live bacteria present within the sample. And you can see that as the concentration decreases, the signal decreases, less nanoparticles will bind to the bacteria because there's less bacteria present. Um, and we can discriminate between there being zero and 10 um, nanoparticles present in each case, which is really quite sensitive. Because in this case, we're not having to do any pre-culture step. We can detect this directly from a, a sample taken. And our latest work has improved this sensitivity as well by using much brighter nanoparticles. We were actually getting down to between detecting four, between four and six bacteria within the sample. But we want to do this in a multiplex. So just to show you in a bit more detail what the multiplex spectrum looks, looks like. So the bottom is the spectrum we get when only salmonella is present. This one we get when only E. coli is present. And this spectrum when only MRSA is present. When all three are present, um, we get this triplex spectrum, which differs from the other ones, but has components within the spectrum of each of these different ones. So we can then use a unique peak within that spectrum to visually identify that this is a triplex. There's a peak here, so that means that um, Salmonella was present. And there's a peak at this position, which means that the MRSC is present. And there's a peak at this position that tells us that the E. coli was present. So we always pick a reporter so that we can visually identify a unique peak to tell them what's present. But when you move to a more complex spectrum or, or sample where you may have different amounts um, of each bacteria present, um, it becomes harder to do that by eye. Um, so we can use data processing techniques um, based on chemometrics, which effectively look at changes across the whole spectrum um, to allow us to identify what the components of that matrix are. So this is essentially showing us where the location of the triplex spectrum is and the singplex. The separation between them means that we can um, identify in it, um, which ones are present um, within that mixture quite easily using a chemometric based approaches. Um, and what we're doing now is moving this. So um, there are various sizes of Raman instruments. A lot of them are, are bench top that you'll find in the laboratory. We have quite small portable ones. But what we're moving towards now is these handheld instruments. So this is an example of one that is commercially available. And the size, the front face of that is about the size of a mobile phone. Um, obviously a bit thicker, um, but this allows us potentially to be able to carry out the detection using this assay at the point of use. So we can take the technique into the clinic or into the food production area rather than having to take the sample to the lab. So that's just, just one area, the kind of point of use type assays we're developing. We're also working on lateral flow these assays, which you'll all be hugely familiar with now. I used to have to explain what a, a lateral flow was based on the pregnancy test as an allergy, but you're all very used to carrying out lateral flow tests now. But if we lateral flow test, um, the, the red color that you see in the strip comes from um, gold nanoparticles, which have an antibody on it that bind to, to um, 
well, in the case that you're used to, um, to, to the COVID virus. Um, but if there is a very faint or low amount of um, biomarker or virus present um, within your sample, then that line might not be visible to your eye because there's too few nanoparticles to find. So by coding these nanoparticles with a reporter molecule, we're looking at more sensitive detection um, by combining it with Raman scratching to read um, lateral flow strips. And also um, by using Raman, your eye is not quantitative. It doesn't tell you um, how much of something is present, but by combining it with the Raman spectroscopy is a potential to make it um, quantitative as well. So there's just some examples um, of assays that we're developing using the combination of Raman surface enhanced Raman um, and, and point of use detection. The second part of the talk, I would like to talk a bit about deep Raman and imaging. Um, so it's, it's really, attractive um, to carry out optical imaging at depth. Um, so for example, to be able to detect things below, below tissue um, in a sample. However, there are some serious limitations to using optical spectroscopy, which means using light um, in, in vivo or in tissue samples. And the really main limitation is that the depth penetration of light through tissue um, is not very deep. Um, visible light will just be absorbed by, by the tissue components and it won't penetrate very far into that tissue. So to carry out um, detection um, in vivo using light, we have to use infrared, red wavelengths, um, because red light penetrates further into the tissue than the visible, um, the, the lower wavelengths light, lights do. So the penetration of light into the tissue, it means it doesn't get very far to detect something that is below, below the surface very easily. So it requires longer wavelengths of light. And optical approaches, for example, using um, fluorescence or Raman spectroscopy, but fluorescence in particular, um, you have to um, add a probe into the system, a fluorescent probe. And it's very hard to make molecules that, that actually absorb and fluoresce at longer wavelengths as well. There's limited capabilities do that. So as well as the light not penetrating far, also having the molecules to detect can be quite challenging. Light scattering can also be an issue with tissue. So the tissue will scatter light and it will scatter that light in all directions. So if you're trying to collect that light, then you're losing some um, as it goes um, in, in different directions uh, within the tissue. Background signals can also be an issue. Um, Fluorescence, for example, there would be a background fluorescence from, from tissue components, from blood, um, that might um, swamp the signal that you're trying to detect. Um, or if you're using Raman, for example, background fluorescence can also be an issue, but also you get signals from, from all the different components that are, that are located within the tissue, the blood, um, et cetera. Speed of um, imaging using optical approaches are currently not fast, although always increasing because it's something that technology always advantage, um, advances. However, the real advantage of using optical imaging compared to using um, ionizing radiation, such as what is used in PET and um, CT MRI machines, is that it avoids using ionizing radiation, which can be damaging um, to, to tissue. Um, and also, th there's only so many times that you can give people CT scans within a year, uh, otherwise it was a potential risk of that um, causing cancer within patients as well. So it avoids the use of ionizing radiation, it's much safer to use optical um, um, wavelengths of light rather, rather than ionizing radiation. Potentially lower cost, these big scary machines that are used for, for imaging are, are very, very expensive. Um, and having to generate that ionizing uh, radiation is more expensive. So potentially um, they could be lower cost if it was ever possible. Um, but, and also the optical approaches give you much more um, molecularly specific information about what, what you're detecting as well as has the potential for higher resolutions to, so to be able to see much smaller things than you would be able to use, um, identify using some of these other approaches. Oh, didn't need to go that far yet. But um, so there's different Raman geometries that can be used. So most Raman instruments use what we term a 
backscattering approach. And normally an objective lens like is used in a standard microscope is used to both deliver the, the laser light to the sample, but also then to collect the random scattered light. So this is what is termed backscattering um, geometry where you interrogate your sample with the laser um, and then can collect the random scattered light from the same point. This can normally only detect um, things that are a few microns thick, but although we can go down to a few millimeters potentially below the surface using this backscattering geometry. SORS, which is spatially offset random scattering. So the spatial offset means that we change the optic arrangement in this system. So we interrogate the sample with the laser, but then we collect the random scattering at a distance that is offset by a, a particular amount. And what this allows us to do is detect signals from deeper within the sample. We'll look at this a bit de more detail in a second. We also have what we term as a transmission approach, where we interrogate with a laser from one side and we collect the random scattering from, from the opposite side. Now, if you want to detect, for example, in vivo or through tissue, this transmission, this approach won't allow you to detect very deep into the sample. This approach um, well, potentially, but you need a sample that is relatively thin that you can take the signal from from one side and collect it the other. Um, whereas a source approach does the collection on the same and the interrogation and the collection of light on the same side of the sample. So if we interrogate with a laser and we have a spatial offset, this allows us to take ramming photons that are deeper within the sample. As that laser offset gets bigger, as the distance between the laser and where we collect the light gets larger, as delta x increases, we obtain signals from deeper and even larger offsets we, we can detect from even deeper within the sample. However, this is limited because, as I said at the beginning, random scattering is intrinsically weak process. So we're still limited in how deep we can go because the random scattered light is weak and it still has to get back out of the sample, back through, through the tissue. And um, so it can be lost on the way out. And also you'll still get a combination of, um, you know, tissue spectrum plus trying to find something at depth. So there'll be a combination of signals obtained. So what doesn't feel like many years ago to me, but to, to some, some of you young people, um, like 10 years ago, um, we come up with combining both surface enhanced Raman with spatially offset Raman with um, Nick Stone and Pavel Matusek. So Pavel developed the source approach and the instrumentation for it. So what we did was, because Raman scattering is weak, we we'll only get weak signals from a depth. So what we wanted to do was combine this with nanoparticles. So we embedded nanoparticles at depth and ultimately with a view to perhaps using nanoparticles to target tumours at depth um, and then locate within tumours and then allow us to carry out the, the Raman detection of, of these species at depth. So by embedding nanoparticles at depth within a system, the thing that we're trying to detect, the tumour now has nanoparticles in it. We know what the signal should be because we've coded that nanoparticle and the, the Raman signal is much stronger because it's a search signal rather than a Raman signal. So could this allow us to detect species at much deeper depth and then carry out the spatial offset to detect these? So yes, it did. Our original experiments, we just simply buried some nanoparticles at the depth and put some tissue layers, the tissue layers being um, pork tissue of different thicknesses on top of the nanoparticle. And our original work showed that we were allowed, we were able to detect through two and a half um, centimetres and then eventually five centimetres. I know that perhaps doesn't sound very far, but for an optical approach, this is actually very um, deep that the light will penetrate and collect signals from within a sample. Um, however, the original work we did was actually a transmission approach. So we were um, interrogating from one side and collecting the random scattering from another. And this works well for the, the, the area that Nick and Pavel are interested in for the detection of breast cancer because the mammogram for breast um, 
breastfeeding would um, compress the breast anyway and allow for, for transmission ramming to, to occur through it. However, for other approaches, I'm just going to skip by that screen and we'll wear um, For other approaches, um, it, you know, transmission is not desirable because you want to collect the signal, hold the spectrometer against it, interrogate and collect the signal from the same side. So there is a commercial system rather than a large bench top system that is handheld that can be used for source detection that's made um, well by now by Agilent. So what our setup uses is this handheld system has an 830 nanometer laser. So as I said, you need longer wavelengths of light to penetrate through, through tissue and skin. So 830 is a near infrared wavelength, so it will pen, penetrate through skin. We're using 100 nanometer gold nanoparticles, um, which are then buried at depth um, to see whether we can detect these. And then we have to put a Raman reporter, a molecule on the surface that will allow us to, to get our spectrum back and identify them. So these lovely calcogen molecules were made by Mike Detti at the University of Buffalo. They, they all um, have selenium and sulfurs that bind strongly to the metal surface, which allows them to stay on the nanoparticle and be orientated to give us a strong surge response. So the numbers here of the dye relate to the absorbance maximum of that dye. So these are really um, absorb um, in the infrared region. And what you'll notice is this 823 dye has an absorbance, 823 nanometers, which is very close to being in resonance or is in resonance with our excitation wavelength of 830 nanometers. So Putting your money on it, you would think that this is going to give us the strongest um, cell response because we're going to get the resonance effect by this combination of this dye um, and this excitation wavelength. These two are commonly used commercial Raman reporter molecules. They are uncolored, but they give very good um, Raman spectrum at long excitation wavelengths. Oops, so what we did was we took a cuvette of nanoparticles that were coated with these Raman reporter molecules and put some tissue in front of it um, and five millimetres of tissue in front of it and then took the source spectrum. And what you can see right away, as we expected, the largest signal came from the dye and um, the nanoparticles with the dye on it that was in resonance um, with um, the excitation wavelengths. So now we have what we term surface enhanced spatially offset resonance Raman spectroscopy, another acronym. But basically, we have now tuned the nanoparticles such that they get a stronger signal, but can we detect them at lower depths? So, what FE did in this work was to take cuvette of nanoparticles and then increase um, the amount, the layers of pork tissue that were in front of this cuvette. So in the top spectrum here, this is the spectrum of what the dye molecule on its, um, well, the dye absorbed on the nanoparticle looks like. The bottom spectrum is the Raman signal. So you will still get Raman from the tissue itself, as well as cells from the, the nanoparticles in front of it. So this is what the Raman of the tissue looks like. And this is the spectrum you get an eight millimeter offset, an eight millimeter offset between the laser and the collection optics. What you can see, this is a combination of the dye and the tissue. But what it means is that um, under 15 millimeters of tissue, we can still see those nanoparticles. This is the subtraction spectrum where we've just subtracted um, the, the tissue background from the offset to show the dye peak here. And again, through 25 millimeters of tissue, we can still see that, that dye at depth. So given this is a handheld system, which are generally not as sensitive as the benchtop system, we are now getting sensitivities that are close to what we saw previously, but using a handheld portable system. However, we were just looking at nanoparticles um, um, behind tissue. Um, in a cuvette, so there was a lot of nanoparticles in that cuvette. So what would happen if we have a lower amount of nanoparticles? What we did was take a bit of tissue, spot a really small amount of nanoparticles down, about um, you know, 10 to the 10 nanoparticles in that solution, um, spot it down and then put another bit of tissue on top of it, then mounted the portable instrument above the tissue. 
And in this case, what she did was did some imaging, some very crude imaging. She moved the sample three millimetres, took a spectrum, moved the sample three millimetres, took a spectrum. And in that way, was able to build, build up a map um, to try and locate where the nanoparticles were within that tissue, where the spot of nanoparticles was. What you see is this false colour image showing um, the location of the nanoparticles, where you see the red um, and where their absence. So in this way, we managed to image through 15 millimetres of tissue. However, that was just spotting down some nanoparticles. So what happens if we want to liken this more to, to a tumour environment? Um, so in this case, we grew multicellular tumor spheroids. So essentially this is growing a ball of cells. Um, so it's a, a way of ex vivo trying to create um, a tumor model um, where we grow a ball of cells um, and then can we target the nanoparticles to that to see whether we could detect them um, at depth under tissue. So we use the MCF7, which are breast cancer cells. Um, and we added some, some of the, the nanoparticle tags to it and, and then grew them in, into spheroids. So don't ask me how many nanoparticles were inside each spheroid. These are the spheroids grown here in the lid um, because we're not sure. Um, we couldn't characterize them as such, but it'll be a lot less than we're using than we spotted down previously. So we then took some tissue, spotted down the spheroid containing the nanoparticles onto it and put some tissue at the top. So we're now looking at a, a small tumour model full of tumour uh, cancer cells with some nanoparticles in it. And again, we were able to take this through 15 millimetres of tissue at depth. So you can see this is located here um, an image across the top. Um, I'm going to skip through the next. Are, I'm aware that we're running out of time. But what, what this approach did allow us was that we could detect the nanoparticles at depth. Um, but in that case, we weren't targeting the nanoparticles to the tumour in any way. We were just adding um, the nanoparticles in there as they grew. They weren't targeted and telling us that it was specifically that it was breast cancer rather than another type of cancer. So unfortunately, breast cancer is very prevalent prevalent with one in eight women in the UK will develop um, breast cancer at some point in their lives. Um, and screening using mammograms miss um, one in five of breast cancers as well. But what is important about the identification of breast cancer is obviously to identify its location, um, its grades, how large that tumour is, um, um, how, how um, which will detect dictate how it's treated, but what is also important is a receptor status. Um, so what receptors are on the surface of that cancer, because that will um, dictate what treatment, what therapy is given. So what Anastasia did was develop nanoparticles that were targeted to different um, cancer types, um, and we'll be able to detect cancer biomarkers simultaneously. So what she did was take nanoparticles and then put an antibody that was specific to, to a marker um, for, for a different breast cancer type as well as a reporter and then target. And eventually we want to be able to do this in vivo to put these nanoparticles into animals to start with to detect, um, to detect tumors um, in vivo, but at the moment we're not, we're not there. I'm going to skip through this because I'm aware time of, of talking too much and um, I've put too much information in here. So estrogen receptor um, is over expressed in the majority of breast cancers. So 65 to 75 percent of uh, breast cancers have um, overexpressed um, estrogen um, receptors on the surface. So you can make nanoparticles with an antibody that binds specifically to that estrogen receptor and also has a code on it that allows us to identify it. Um, so what Anastasia did was incubate the nanoparticles with um, breast cancer cells, which are MCF7. So these have estrogen positive breast cancer cells. So they have the estrogen receptor on the surface and also with estrogen negative um, breast cancer cells. So what we saw, where there's a red dot here means there's a nanoparticle based on the, the location of, of the SER signal. 
Um, so what we saw was nicely that our, our nanoparticles do target. So we have a much higher accumulation of nanoparticles um, which have the estrogen receptor um, than that that doesn't when we target it. We can also quantify this and much potentially of the receptor is present um, dependent on the signal response. So we have much higher accumulation of the nanoparticles in, in the, in the um, estrogen positive receptor, um, breast cancer and much lower in the non-estrogen positive. Um, so what this does tell us, and we expect this because um, nanoparticles are still not specifically uptaken by cells. Um, so if they're non-targeted, we still got up some uptake of the nanoparticles, but we get much higher uptake um, when the receptor is present. We can also 3D image the cells to find out where the nanoparticles are. And what we discovered is that the nanoparticles are actually going inside the cells. So they're not just staying on the su surface where, where they will initially encounter the estrogen receptor, they're actually being internalized and taken inside the cells because we can see signal all the way through it. What I mean by this, if we have the estrogen receptor on the surface of the cell, our nanoparticles are binding to it through, through the antibody. The antibody is then binding them, and then the, um, the, the receptor is then internalizing the nanoparticle, forming this um, vesicle, which is then taking the nanoparticle inside, um, inside the cell. I'm just going to skip over this, but I'm going to next one. Sorry. So what we can do is we really want you to understand whether the uptake of the nanoparticles was specific or non-specific. Was the uptake happening through the estrogen receptor or were just the nanoparticles um, being gobbled up by the cell in a non-specific way? Um, and there's different ways that we looked at to, to try and figure this out. But one of the ways was if we block um, the surface of the cell with excess antibody that bind, that blocks the estrogen receptor binding site because it will bind to that antibody first so it means it can't bind to something else. Um, if we then add our nanoparticle and that no longer binds then we know that it was specifically interacting with that receptor and being taking, taken into the cell. So what we saw was what we hoped to see that when we untreat the cell, we just add our nanoparticles. These are able to bind to the receptor and make a strong uptake of the nanoparticles. When we block the receptor with an antibody, then the nanoparticles are no longer being uptaken. So what this tells us is that the, the, our nanoparticles are specifically targeting the receptor on that cell, um, and it's not a non-specific interaction. The advantage of this is, so if you were to um, inject um, nanoparticles into someone, someone tumours grow quickly um, and they will non-specifically uptake nanoparticles. However, if you're trying to detect or use nanoparticles for, for therapeutic um, effects, you want to get as many of the nanoparticles to that tumour site as, as possible. So there will be non-specific uptake, but if you can target them using um, targeting a specific receptor, one, it will tell you what receptor is present, which would aid the treatment and the, the deciphering of what type of cancer it is. And two, it would allow more accumulation of the nanoparticles at the tumour site, which would aid um, in the detection because there's more um, nanoparticles present there to detect, but also if you're using it um, for therapeutic approaches. So what we're really trying to understand is that targeting effect. And we see quite clearly that by targeting the nanoparticles to the tumour, we're getting much more localization of the nanoparticles where we want them at the tumour site. I'm just going to flip through this, but we can also treat the, the, the cells with a drug. So Filverstrand uh, is a drug that is used to treat estrogen positive um, breast cancer, and it has multiple different mechanisms, which I'm not going to go through, but the one that we were interested in was the fact that it degrades the estrogen receptor. So by treating um, cells with this drug, it should destroy the estrogen receptor um, and stop nanoparticles being in internalized um, because there's no receptor there anymore. 
this is Western blot data, but basically the size of this line is just telling you how much estrogen receptor there is present on the cells. So as we treat the breast cancer cells, the estrogen positive breast cancer cells with the drug, um, as we increase the amount of drug, you can see the amount of receptor decreases. So there's a decreasing amount of receptor on the surface of that cell that is responding to the treatment effectively. But we want, then wanted to treat with a drug, which should reduce the receptor amount, and then add our nanoparticles. And do we see an equivalent decrease in the Raman cell signal, the interaction of the nanoparticles with the cell surface as the amount of receptors decrease? And yes, we do. When there's no treatment, we can see there's a lot of nanoparticles binding to the estrogen receptor. When we add some full, full strand, which should reduce the amount of receptors on the surface, we see a decreased interaction with the nanoparticles. And if we add even more of the drug, we see an even further reduced interaction. And the, the amount of signal that we get back corresponds um, with the amount of nanoparticles that are bound, which is also corresponds with the amount of receptor on the surface. So this approach could also be used to monitor drug treatment because what this is showing, so for example, if you had patient cells, you could, um, in a dish, um, treat it with a drug, see if the drug, the patient cells are responding to that drug, i.e. is it reducing the receptor status of that and use the nanoparticles to then quantify um, that, that, that response to the cells. But we want to, I'm going to skip through that, um, we want to eventually use this into um, to move in vivo. But oh, I don't want to stick nanoparticles um, into any mice or um, animals until we're really sure of the targeting effect and that the nanoparticles actually end up where we want to go. Because when you move into an animal model, it's obviously a much more complex environment. So what we've been doing is working with um, Michele um, and Carla at the University of Strathclyde. Uh, our colleagues who make microfluidic devices, these microfluidic devices, you can grow spheroids, so those balls of cells, um, of cancer cells within the microfluidic device. Um, and each of these spheroids are individually, we can change the conditions, we can add different things to each of these spheroids. So they're grown over a number of days, the cells are seeded, they then aggregate and grow into these balls, these spheroids. Um, we can then interrogate these and put nanoparticles into them and drugs and then watch what happens. So if we, so we have MCF7 cells again, so these are the estrogen positive cells. If we target these with a mixture of nanoparticles, so one nanoparticle has um, an antibody that will bind to the estrogen receptor and a particular Raman code and has a signature, so the same ones that we were using in the previous experiment. We also add these with a mixture of a nanoparticle that has an antibody that targets the HER2 receptor, which is another um, receptor that's often overexpressed in a in different type of breast cancer. And that has a different Raman reporter, so a different signal. So essentially, if we didn't know if it was a HER2 or an estrogen receptor positive cell, um, we would add a mixture of these two nanoparticles and look to, at the spectroscopy data spectroscopy to find out which of the nanoparticles bound, which would then tell us what the receptor status of that, that tumour was. So we added a mixture of the two nanoparticles um, to this um, sphere, so we were able to flow them past this in this microfluidic device, because we want to understand that in a more realistic environment where you have a ball, a tumour of cells, and we have a flowing system of blood trying to deliver nanoparticles to that system while the nanoparticles still bind. So what we see is we can look to also see how many of the targeted nanoparticles, the ER ones, that have this signature, um, versus the non-targeted ones that have this random signature bind. So what you can see is instantly that we have much higher binding of the targeted estrogen receptor. We still have some non-specific binding, and we would expect that, of the non-targeted nanoparticle. 
some of those nanoparticles are going to get caught within that steroid and be non-specifically uptaken. So we do expect non-specific binding. And a lot of approaches use untargeted nanoparticles anyway. But what we see is when we use targeted nanoparticles, we get much higher binding and uptake. Um, and we can look at a, a, a false color image here just showing the huge increase in the number of nanoparticles that are targeted versus non that are binded, binding to the tumor. So what this does tell us in this more complex system that we are getting um, much more uptake in, when we use targeted versus non-targeted nanoparticles. And we can go through this. Um, we can do a three-dimensional image um, through that spheroid. And we can see that the nanoparticles aren't just sitting on the outside of the spheroid structure. They're actually penetrating into the center of the spheroid, so actually being uptaken into the tumor, which could be important if you were using it for um, therapeutic applications of nanoparticles. So for example, you could target nanoparticles to deliver drugs um, or to heat up to kill the tumor. But what we see here is that nanoparticles are actually going into the center of the tumor, which would help if you were trying to kill that tumor using the nanoparticle. And we also see that if we treat them with a drug um, in that, that spheroid system, as we add the fulvar strand again, which destroys that receptor, even within that 3D system, compared to the two-dimensional just cells on a plate, that we are seeing that as we increase the amount of drug, we are decreasing the amount of nanoparticle uptake, which shows that that drug is working and is starting to kill that estrogen receptor, degrade that estrogen receptor, which will be helping to treat um, that tumour. So that would also allow you to use this system to, again to screen different drugs for their effectiveness um, um, and whether you, that could be used for personalised treatment where you use patient-derived cells to grow a tumour and then look at different treatment regimes that could be used to help that patient, particularly if they've developed some drug resistance um, in terms of previous treatments for recurring breast cancer, because obviously the treatments that are used for, for, for any cancer are hugely debilitating in terms of their side effects. So if you could perhaps personalize that treatment to their cancer to limit the amount of um, different combinations of drugs that needed to be used, then that would be a huge advantage. So we want to combine this with the depth detection. We haven't done that yet because we want to understand the system as much as possible, the targeting and the ability to detect at depth um, the specificity before we move to, to animal systems because um, I don't want to harm any animals until we know that the whole system is working. But in the future, we'll be moving this all towards in vivo. Um, yeah, to use these targeted nanoparticles and, and move them into to animal models. Right, I'm going to finish there because I've, I've rushed through a bit, but hopefully I told you a bit about some of the different approaches that would be used for detection of disease-relevant biomarkers. So we, we, I showed you the example of bacteria detection, but we're also working in, in other inflammatory um, markers, such as CRP. Um, Drug-induced liver damage is also something we have a big project going on, um, with sepsis um, biomarkers, as well as cardiovascular. Multiplexing offers significant advantages. So if we can get more opportunity to exploit the advantages of cells where we can detect more things, biomarkers um, or, 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 or um, markers within one, one test. There's a huge um, advantage to that rather than having to detect multiple tests. Um, we get great sensitivity by combining SORS um, with SERS, where we're um, through to 25 millimeters using this approach, although we have some recent work um, which we've just published um, using brighter, stronger nanoparticles, where we're, we're seeing um, detecting down to 48 millimeters. Um, so potentially useful if we, we don't have to detect too deep into tissue. Um, and we're looking towards targeting um, these towards tumor um, detection or understanding tumor growth. Right, I'll finish there. I'll thank all the people that did the work. Um, in the lab that I've worked with over the years, uh, these people for funding and oh, the faces of the people that actually did the work. Quite a few pictures in the pub, but I apologise. I'll stop talking now if you have any questions. <laughs>
Thank you so much. Um, I'm sure I speak for everyone when I say it's such an incredibly engaging talk um, and the applications are just so incredible. So yeah, uh, does anyone have any questions? Feel free to type in the chat. I have stunned you all into silence. So I rushed over a few slides there, but I wanted to explain um, some things in a bit more detail without rushing. That was perfect. If no one has any questions, you're free to, you can email me afterwards if, um, if you want. Um, I'm not, my email address is easy to find on the web. Or equally, if anyone's watching this at a later date, then please feel free to email me if you've got any questions. Just some thanks in the chat. Um, but yeah, thank you so much, and I'll end the talk here.